Here are 10 ways to dominate any opponent, no matter who it is, in ITF sparring. Hey Elk, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Fight Chat Friday from TKD Coach Academy. This week, we're discussing 10 universal principles to beat anyone in ITF Taekwondo sparring. And these principles have been tested and proven to be effective in competitive sparring. So whether you're a beginner or an experienced fighter, these principles can help you improve your performance, give you an edge over your opponents. So if that sounds like that's what you need, we have a great episode for you today. Yeah, so this is episode 126 of Fight Chat Friday, so we're going to get right into it with number one, one of the main things that you need, it's an unbeatable battering ram. What does that mean? For us, that's the sidekick off the front leg, and that's going to be very, very valuable. If you have a good, solid sidekick, you can attack and defend with, like we see here, Gilles Brown in red. He's one of the guys who has a very, very solid sidekick. It's going to be very useful for you to beat any type of opponent. If you can get the timing, the distance correct with these, and be very threatening with it, it is a massive weapon to beat any opponent. Yeah, and I suppose the main thing with the sidekick as well is it's it's doing a couple of things for you, lets you cover distance, lets you attack and defend, and pretty much puts up that fence between you and your opponent. So you get to have that uh, that safety net as well as something to threaten with. So step one, unbeatable battering ram of a sidekick. So our next one, create, don't wait. Just as an overall principle in sparring, it is good to lead and not be waiting on your opponent to give you an opportunity. They never have to. It's always a choice. They have to make it, or, you know, that they might not make a mistake. So much better if you're the one who's forcing the errors and creating the opportunities. Yeah, definitely. You don't want to be hanging around, waiting, make that moment. If there's somebody kind of testing the waters, waiting and being patient, be that one that goes and takes the fight to them. Be clever about it, but definitely be the person who creates. Don't just wait around. So next we have avoiding warnings. And we've d talked often about how you really can't afford to concede more than about five warnings over two two-minute rounds. Uh, and we have some examples here where you can see the score flipping in those last moments of the match. You don't want to leave yourself in a position where that can happen by conceding too many warnings too early in the match. Yeah, it gives you a buffer to play with at the end of a match. If you can afford to have that as your way to finish the match, don't want to be the person who finishes with a flip at the end of a competition because that's going to have you out very early. So make sure you don't concede more than those five warnings. Ideally, keep them even less. And the main things that we find that people give away warnings for are exiting the ring and falling over. Falling over usually happens from spinning and exits usually happen from making decisions too late before the last mat of the ring so next we have an efficient use of energy so you don't want to be the one who is making poor decisions about when to work and how to work so you can overwork yourself and it uh, really doesn't lead to any improvement of the game state so we want to look at techniques and strategies that make your opponent work harder to regain ground to gain space in the ring and here we see a little bit from Gilles in terms of making sure the opponent is having to work around the edges of the ring and give him the center. And what that can do is it means that they're the ones that are out there, they're a bit more stressed, their movement's a little bit more uh, constrained, and they have to find space to spar. Yeah, for sure. And this also ties into your training and preparation in terms of being prepared to actually go the distance and have that high output. That's very important. You don't want to be coming in with that in the back of your mind. Am I prepared for this physically and in terms of cardio? You want to be prepared so you can hang with anybody depending on what type of intensity or level of um, like volume, let's say, that they bring to a fight. Yeah, and we're not really saying that you want to not work hard. And in fact, that's going to be a principle later on. What it's saying is you want to be in control of when you work hard and you don't want to have that dictated to you by your opponent. So like what Norway in blue is doing here, she's testing and forcing her opponent to make decisions around kicking by using distance, which then gives her the energy in the legs to go a little bit quicker when she needs to go and put on that pressure. 
absolutely and one of the important things as well in itf sparring we're going to see it actually in this one hands in play ah, okay. is the ability to be able to switch around as well in terms of your intensity go from relaxed and build that up to go to explosive that quick change of momentum and rhythm is something that's effective we see here with anti he's relaxed relaxed and then there's an explosion it's not very predictable but that's important you need to have the hands in play always whether that's attacking or defending here he's using them to defend and keep them in play to not get kicked essentially and then he uses them to keep them in a good position attacking so if your hands are down by your side not very effective in itf we see a lot of people coming through the ranks and you always see the top level people they always have their hands in play to attack faster like we say, see here from tyra and also to defend just in case that gets through and you're in a bad position there you always have that secondary line of defense so we often say that punchers can't be outworked and this is the case of don't let yourself be outworked. You always have to be the person who is willing to put in the, uh, the the tougher work and the higher energy work. And this does come down to your preparation, your conditioning, so you're able to sustain a level of product, productive work throughout the, uh, the match. And it's not just doing stuff for the sake of doing stuff. It is really about um, making sure that you're making clever and effective choices and that what you're doing has effect and that if you have momentum in your favor, you can maintain that. You can keep uh, on that pressure and sustain it. Absolutely. So we talked about using your energy quite efficiently, but this is also about not being lazy. And when the other person tries to outwork you and has a high level of volume, an effective volume, that you're not being the person who's secondary to that. You need to match it at the very least. And if, if you want to be the best person, you have to actually be the person who takes that to the forefront and be the person who has the higher volume and higher output with efficient use of scores and efficient use of techniques as well, not just throwing them aimlessly. So Richie, tell us about this next one. So playing the scoreboard, how do you use the scoreboard to your advantage? It's all about the scoreboard. So we see here, there's an example, 30 seconds left, sorry, three seconds left. And we can see here, time has stopped, one second left on the clock. This is team sparring where all the flags come into play. We see here a push through, pushing the opponent out of the ring, gets the warning, and that's what the scoreboard is all about. We see there's a flip coming up here real soon once Raddick gets back into the ring, and that brings the flags back. And that is all the difference that you need in team sparring, whether it's team or individual, that's the difference. You see that flip. So we talked about the warnings and then we talked about playing the scoreboard. You need to know the scoreboard. It's not about what you think scores or anything like that. It's about what it says on the board. How many points do you need? You need two flags to win an individual. You need to get those two flags at a minimum, ideally with a majority. And that's the trick. We see here Martin Gadea does the exact same thing, recognizes that if he pushes his opponent back, gets the warning. That's the flip. That gets him the win. Three, two, one. And then that's enough for him to win the match, win the World Cup title. And he knows he is that uh, he knows he is that one warning himself to spare, and he's able to travel out of the ring uh, again. And that takes incredible fight intelligence to be able to see and read the scoreboard and decide your actions based on what would have the most impact on the scoreboard. It's something that can be really uh, underappreciated by people who are just watching what's happening in the middle of the ring. Absolutely. You don't always have to be the one who's outworking the other person in terms of like the flashy techniques and all that. It's about you getting on the scoreboard and doing exactly what you need to do to win. So then everybody has the things that they do that are effective, that 20% of everything that you do that gets you the most bang for your buck. And you really have to trust in yourself and in what you know is effective for you. And don't feel like you have to, you know, do what everybody else does. If something works for you, you need to really trust that and use it. Yeah, double down on your strengths, even triple down. Because some people are looking to improve their weaknesses, which is always a good thing to do. But you need to really become the best in the world what you are the best at. Here's an example of somebody who's the best at the world at what they do. Colm Carroll in blue. One of the best people in the world is setting up that blitz. Everybody will agree to that. And he does it so effectively that it's... 80 to 90 percent of his game he knows he's the king at that so he makes sure that that's his best weapon and he brings it out all the time to put it out there to get the scores against his opponent absolutely uh great philis uh, philosophical thing to think of here uh be first and last in every exchange so if you can be the first one in it means you're uh, controlling the dance, you're the person who's uh, creating and not waiting so referring to our earlier principle here but being the one or having it in your mind to finish it also 
kind of keeps you in the exchanges and looking for the productive out in the exchange as well. And I think that's a really important idea to have. And we saw in that example, a really good one from Timothy Boss, where, you know, he uses the, the blitz to get in, but he stays in contact until he can find that exit shot that's going to be productive for him and give him the highest value on the exchange. Yeah, be sure to read that one again. It's land, not throw. So you want to land the first shot in the exchange and land the last shot. Doesn't mean you're mm -hmm. throwing the last shot. If you can pull out of there, exit out of contact, contact, sorry, without getting hit, that's the job done for you. So we see here, Yazin does a good job with that turning kick to the body. He's the last one to land. That's the important part. So it's not about the last one to throw. And when we were t talking about some of the most essential sparring skills, an interesting one that came up that uh, uh, myself and Richie talked about was this last one, which is resilience, which, you know, it doesn't automatically jump out there as a sparring skill. But when we're, whether we're talking about the ability to sustain setbacks within the match, whether we're talking about the ability to recover from injury uh, or to stay fighting fit throughout a career, resilience is a massive, massive, massive thing. Yeah, that, that mental strength, that grit, it all ties into this, I think. Uh, and for me, one of the big factors of this is, is thinking about what comes next. And that's one of the phrases that you use a lot, Adrian, what's important now or what's yes. important next, that win mentality. So that's the important part. You're not thinking of the score that just went in too much. You're not thinking about too far ahead in the future. It's what's the next action I need to make to make a step forward. And that's what it's all about, really, the resilience, the mental strength, the mental fortitude, and that grit to go and get it done, where whatever work needs to be done. Absolutely. And it's all of these tips are giving people maybe a few ideas, you know, another lens to go back and look at their sparring and see, okay, which of these things am I maybe falling down on, not considering or not giving enough value to as a part of my game? And you know, they're really simple, simple principles, but like many things that are simple in concept, they're not easy. So you got to put in the work to be able yeah. to make you effective use of these things. Yeah. So the more of these things that you can have in, in, in your favor and your pocket, the more advantage that you're going to have and the bigger possibility you have of beating anybody in ITF. So these are the, the big solid things that you want to be getting. They're not the only things that make you win an ITF sparring match, whether it's competition or whatever. But these are a good, solid list of 10 principles that if you can work on these, they're going to put you in the right direction. For sure. So, folks, that's what we've got for you this Friday. Hopefully you enjoyed that and you'll join us again next week when we tackle another topic. And, of course, like always, if there's something that you'd like us to tackle, reach out to us on social media, put a question in the comments, and we'll be happy to tackle anything that's of interest to the members. That's it. So we'll see you in the next video. Bye now.